Here's another job that I did. And this was a trade I did in the street. It's a little while ago now, but it's a great piece. And it was for um, Tom Fancy's The Division, which is by Ubisoft and Massive Entertainment. It was, we did work on the game trailer that they showed at E3, and I worked with a guy called Patrick Clare, a uh, director from Antibody. And a whole bunch of people, there were about five of us on the, on the job. I think we had about you know, eight or nine weeks to do the whole job. And I was pretty much in charge of the 3D. So, Antibody, uh, if you haven't seen the work, Patrick Clare, brilliant director, amazingly talented. It's one of the few jobs I've ever worked on where the client was happy with absolutely everything. We didn't do any late nights, and everything was delivered on time, and, uh, and that was it. It's unheard of. Um, so, the idea behind the game is that there's a pathogen that gets released in society. It's a typical dystopian world, um, and it gets on banknotes, and everyone starts dying. Really happy game. Um, so the, the, the idea that actually came up with was that we live in a fragile world and it's uh, very complex but it's um, very vulnerable. And the idea behind the word complex is that each of the letters represents an area of society that could collapse, such as uh, transport, health, air, transport, energy, shipping, fuel. And each one of these little worlds is incredibly complex in its own right. And once again, cinema came to the rescue so that we could kind of facilitate having all of that level of detail and being able to focus on each element, just like in HBO, hold huge amounts of layers, um, lots of elements, but each one in its own right was particularly, wasn't particularly tricky to make. Actually, this didn't really present too many technical challenges. It was a bit of a joy to, to work on. So, what I thought we could do was have a look at how we just made like a couple of the elements, like a couple of the worlds. And the guys, we did this as a, in the workshop, we went through one of these and um, broke down how we did it. But I thought we could do it, I could show you guys how, how that happened as well. And the thing is with this project is if you look at this, these are these cars. Like, I mean, I, I guess those of you that do 3D have at some point or another worked with a stock 3D model from TurboSpeed or, or whoever. And, get the 9 million polygon model, <laughs> which they don't ever give you the low cage so you can subdivide it. And each one of these cars, it's like super high res. So just managing that in itself and trying to keep it so that we could uh, facilitate any changes that the client needed um, with as much ease of use as possible. And it's just a, a game way of approaching it in the right way, breaking it down into the component parts and thinking, how can I make this um, so that uh, you know, my license is possible. And obviously, you know, we don't want to be stressed out of work and technically challenged. We want to enjoy it. We want to be able to be creative with the artists, and that's what it's about. So um, let's have a look at uh, the project. We can have a look at how, how we uh, tackled some of this. So the first thing that I thought we could look at is just basically the actual the, the complete scene itself. And honestly, on this Mac, Mac Pro, it's a nightmare to only if I make everything visible. Forever. But again, massively extensive use of layers. Layers are just really underrated. You know, there's layers for everything. You notice that a lot of them have got these little X's in them. Because what we did here is they all used X refs. So rather than try and build everything in one scene, each one of the letters is its own scene. And they're using an X ref, so it's an external file reference. And that offers um, some really good benefits to big projects because it means that you can have one guy in this scene, just doing some camera animation, setting up the camera between all the shots, framing it all, while someone else is building each one of these individual scenes. Because they exist as separate scenes, it means you can have a separate artist working on each one. And all I need to do is come in here and, and enable this. And, uh, <coughs> I think I clicked in. Um, I don't think I actually clicked in. Oh, maybe. Um, oh, just oh, to oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit like that. Um, so that's the end anyway, which is the city here. So I thought what we'd do is just have a quick look at how we build the city because, you know, um, you can go out and you can get like a race field for the city here. Okay, so it's a kid's bit. This is coming out of it. 
So none of the buildings in here are like high body or anything, it's not too much detail. But actually, you know, we, we did this in our workshop and we built this city in like an hour, um, showing everyone how to do it. I already had the buildings made, to be honest, but other than that, we, we went through the whole process of um, using mobile so that we can like, distribute the buildings exactly how we want. So I thought I'd just show you like, how easy that is and how easy cinema makes this kind of stuff. So if we come in here and have a look. So what we started off with is just a bunch of buildings. It's really simple, they're just kind of a few discreet cubes with a bunch of details of new aerials and um, some air conditioning units. Nothing complicated at all. Of course it could work with um, high, high res models as well. Um, but you can see they're really simple, they didn't need to be anything more than that. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to be able to arrange the buildings so that we had the tall buildings in the middle and then as we went out to the edge of the city we had the smaller buildings. Cloner, it's really cool that it has an option to allow you to do that. <coughs> What's important here is the order that they're placed as children. So we've got the taller buildings and the mid-sized ones and the smaller ones. And then you can just use an effector to control which buildings make visible. So first thing was to just take the uh, cloner and make a grid array of it. So now we've got this block of buildings. Very uniform, not exactly the, the ideal look that we were after. So by setting our cloner like this, in a nice simple box shape, what we could do is I could use, um, a, I've got a mouse here, I'll hide that, I'll hide that. So, you see we've got this, it's just a single polygon object, one polygon. Um, and on here we've got this texture. But if we open this texture up, you can see in here we've got a uh, layer shader. Now the layer shader is a really cool feature. It's one of my favorite features. It's just like having Photoshop within one shader. It allows you to pop images, shaders, and use blend nodes. Um, you can use landmarks, all sorts of stuff. And you don't need to go back, you know, you've got transform effects, you've got color correction tools all within here. So you can come up and you can add in um, you know, brightness, contrast, and saturation, and transformations. Um, but here, what we've basically got is just a simple gradient. And by using the luminance values of this gradient, we can say, okay, when it's black, I want to use the tallest buildings, and when it's white, I want to use the smallest buildings. It's just going to look at the hierarchy, and it's going to, if you use this with an effector, it's just like doing a displacement or something, because really the if you displace something, the black won't necessarily move, but the white will. And the effector does that. It looks at the value and it says, okay, when it's black, my, I don't have any strength, but when I'm white, I have full strength. We just use it like this, it's a bit uniform. So I just add some noise on the top, and it should work. So, if we just hide that and have a look. And that's this first shader effector. So all I've done is grab this tag here and just dropped it into this shading tab here. And this effector is set to use this parameter at the bottom, modify clone. So we take this down to zero and we enable this. Nothing happens. I'll make this a bit bigger for you. So this effector is on. If we now modify clone and pull this up, you can see it's slowly rearranging the buildings based on that luminance. As we pull it all the way up, now you can see that it's taking that grayscale values and it's putting all the cities in this corner yeah. and all the smaller all the cities, all the tall buildings and the smaller ones around the edges. If we come to our top view though, you can see that these are all so uniform, it's like New York City. Um, so one of the things I thought we could do is just rotate some of them. So here, we have another shader effector, and this is set to rotate in 90 degrees. And in the shading tab, it's just using noise, but you notice with this noise, it's been 
basically high contrast. If we take that contrast down, we enable this. You can see that they're all kind of arbitrarily rotated based on the luminous values of that noise. But really, we only want it to be either 90 degrees or 0 degrees. So by making that contrast 100%, means we only have pure black and white, so some of them are reflecting and some of them are being so easy to see. Yeah. These things are just so simple really, and you, know, you, build, you build a city very, very quickly. You know. Just added in some randomness with a random, random effector, just to make the position values slightly less um, uniform, a bit more organic. The other cool thing about working with MoGraph is that not only can you manage like, hundreds of objects easily. You can also be quite specific and you can go right in, you can hone in on certain objects and you can say, okay, I just want to affect only this one object or only these. And you can do that with these mobile selections. So mobile selection is just like making a selection of some points or anything that you want. And you can say, okay, I've made my select of those, I just want to do one thing with those. But all I really wanted to do with those was get rid of them. So now we've got the L shape already. So now we've got the L. And then we come in and have a look at this. And we're thinking, okay, this is looking okay, we're getting there. But the uh, architect here has put like, all these buildings all the same. Can't have all those buildings the same. So once again, we can make a selection. And you can see I've just selected these three buildings. And we can just say, okay, I just want to change those three. I don't like the fact that those three are all the same. So here we've got a random effector. which is just set to change those. If we don't like it, we can just change the C value. And of course you can do that with one, one if you want. Yesterday when we were doing the master class, we set up playing cards. We used one shade and multi-shade for the whole thing, you know, one, one piece of geometry, and every card was unique. And then we decided just to change one of them to the ace of spades. And it's just using this exact same technique. Now because it was such a happy, Happy trailer, we thought we'd better add some more grey in there. So we used uh, the mobile colour shader, and the colour shader is really cool because it allows you to, um, just like we were using the grayscale values to control which building, you can use grayscale values to colour your buildings. And uh, this random effect so just allows that, and it just meant that when we render it, we get lots of some lovely grey buildings. <laughs> Really nice and simple, just a little bit of ambient occlusion. And then all we needed to do was just add in the platform underneath, and we were, you know, that was done. And the other cool thing about cinema and this project is that we look at the top here, we've got these front platforms. They're just null objects and just position there, and we've got external compositing tags on those. Because there's so much of that trailer was, you know, comp. Comp did a brilliant job. And just by adding those in, export that to After Effects. Take the camera over, and then they've got a point of reference, and then you can add these clouds, etc. Because the clouds are all just cards with the clouds put on them, um, just still images. And it meant that we had a really nice pipeline between the 3D and the comp. So when we were setting the project up right at the very beginning, even with like wireframes, we were exporting our AEC files, taking it into After Effects, and then they could start setting up the look. Um, so you've got your pipeline in place right from the beginning. And then as you develop the look here, you start getting your decent renders coming out. They've already got the After Effects comp set up, they spring it in, swap it out, and then they all just come together. That's pretty cool. The other scene that I wanted to show you was another scene from this job, and it was the one with the cars. I just thought this was quite an interesting one to show you. Um, once again, layers. So here we've got just like a you know, pretty basic road, pretty basic geometry. And I've just got that solo at the moment, so I can, I can move around it. But the whole thing with this is that it's all based on one spline, um, not the whole scene, of course, but, but one spline here. So you kind of grab this and move it. You can see everything moves around with it. But the cool thing about using this one spline is that we can then use that, and we can use that to add in, like, um, the central resolution. We've got, let me just put it up here. See how it slows down. We've got some golden street lights. We've got the central resolution. We've got these barriers at the edge. 
And if the art director is playing the signal, you just change the letters and you move it around. We can just change that spline and everything on there will stay in place and it will always move around with it. So we haven't got to start repositioning everything and rewriting it all. We can just redraw that spline and all those elements will stay on there. You can even use instances of the same spline for other elements. Um, and that's exactly how we did the other. There's two parts to this, two roads. That's exactly how we did both of them. That's exactly how we did the columns attached to it, all based on spines. And then we just took the spines and did similar ones so that we could create the vehicles. So if I just switch these off and just put the vehicle on, we can just leave the road there, put the vehicles on. And as I mentioned before, these vehicles, there's, there's quite a lot here. Um, and they're all pretty high res. These are special ones. These are, these are called car paints. <laughs> but if we come in, just have a look, so you can just see, appreciate like, the, the level of detail. You know. <laughs> so like, these keep coming in. Uh, so pretty high res energy. You know. They didn't really need to be that high res. Um, but some of the shots, they are pretty close. You know, Some of the shots in the, in the trailer, we're, we're, we're like this sort of close. So. It's useful for that. And I'm not, I don't know how many cars and vehicles we've got on there, but you can see it's a little bit laggy. Um, if I press, I'm not sure I'm going to press play. <laughs> but really, we need to press play, otherwise, how are we going to animate it? And note that they're all run on spines, they're all done with Cloner, and they, and they all animate automatically using the Cloner object, just like the bicycle chains. So, to make it so that we could actually work with this, we came up, let's use a really simple little bit of espresso here. And on each of these instances, we have this option for a low and a high res version. And then if we scroll down here, and this one object, I've got this little checkbox here. And this goes with this condition though, so it says, okay, if this box, if this checkbox is checked, we can use the second one, the high res one. I'll also, can you name it? Please, so I don't have to name them all. Um, and if not, I'm going to show the low res one. And these low res models are just we can do it right where we have them there. So if we just switch this off, there we go. And we've got high res there on now. <laughs> but that means now I can press play, you know, and we can now, so now we can work, we can set up our hand and do all our work. And then we're happy with it, and we come back and we just switch this thing, and then eventually you can see the high res version. So it just really allows for like a really nice, easy workflow, facilitates more creativity, you don't get bogged down with the technical aspects, and it's much more fun. So, the only other thing I wanted to do, we should have a look at the trailer just to remind us of see that work, see how it came out. In 2001, a real-world exercise tested the emergency response to a bioterror attack on the continental United States. The operation was called Dark Winter. Within just a few days, the simulation spiraled out of control. The operation predicted a rapid breakdown in essential institutions, civil disorder, and massive civilian casualties. Dark Winter has revealed how vulnerable we've become. Our lifestyle, our security, our safety, depends on a delicate and unstable economy. We've created a system so complicated that we no longer understand how to control it. Oil, power, shipping, transport. We live in a complex world. And the more complex it gets, the more fragile it becomes. The system is built on a global supply chain that gets things where they're needed, just in time. We've created a house of cards. Remove just one, and everything falls apart. And what's fueling the system? Money. Americans can spend $90 billion in a single day of shopping. Last year, 200 million people swarmed their local stores on November 23rd. We call that day Black Friday. Did you know that a flu virus can survive on the surface of a banknote for up to 17 days? One day, there will be a pandemic. It could begin during the crush of Black Friday sales. A pathogen will jump from tainted banknotes to human skin. 
onto food, toys, children, and loved ones. By the time patient zero feels the first sore throat, millions of people will already be infected. From this point, the breakdown will happen fast. Day one, hospitals will reach capacity. Panic will strike. Day two, quarantine zones will be established. Resources will be rationed. Transport will go into lockdown. Day three, international trade will stop. The oil will dry up. The stock market will collapse. Day four, the power will fail. The shelves will be empty. The taps will run dry. And once hunger and despair take hold, people will do anything for survival. By day five, everyone will be a potential threat. In 2007, a new presidential directive was signed quietly into law. This maps out the government's response to a crisis, a plan to cope with a real dark winter. It is known as Directive 51. There are rumors of shadow agencies, sleeper cells, covert agents, but nothing can be confirmed. Our complex world is primed for breakdown. And once the chaos strikes, there won't be resources to save us all. The only question left is, what will it take to save what remains?